Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason Miller. Tonight on the Evan Miller Report, new U.S. led airstrikes in Syria killed more than 100. Jihadists in the past 48 hours. We have a report from the region tonight. A senior Israeli official has took a shot at the United States over Iran's reported purchase of a second hand civilian aircraft, saying the acquisition violated international sanctions. Remains of an American pilot are still in a cockpit in Cameroon. We'll tell you the outrageous story from Johannesburg in tonight's program. Also in tonight's program, remember that uh, remember that UKIP leader who sa- said Nigel Farage should, resi- uh, should resign even after Nigel Farage came back after the UKIP party had him? Well, looks like he's resigned after all. And... Nine men are arrested in that Captain Garter safety deposit raid in the UK, one of the most uh, enormous and disturbing bank robberies in UK history. We have all those stories and more, plus, for you. Thank you, Jay. A landslide in Colombia killed 64 people. I have the latest out of Salgar for you. It's gay conversion therapy and flat shoes today in our continuing battle against Global Socialism. Walmart disappoints in the sales, and Takata recalls even more airbags. Hmm. Live, lose money? Live dangerously. A conductor in the Philadelphia Amtrak derailment adds to the docket in lawsuits across America. And the countdown to Letterman's last late show is on. That's all coming up in this edition of your conservative news source, The Evan Miller Report, starting now. Live from Southern California, this is the Evan Miller Report. Jason Miller with news and politics, Corey Evan with business and entertainment. This is the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media. Here now, Jason Miller. And a very good evening on this Tuesday, May the 19th, 2015. I'm Jason Miller. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to get right into it tonight. We have a lot of news to get to tonight on the program, including UK inflation rates turn negative in the international business news. And one UK clothing chain has been landed with a 22 million pound tax bill. All those stories and more in the International Business Report on the Evan Miller Report, your conservative news source, starting right now on the SHR Media Network. But we start off tonight over in Syria, where airstrikes by U.S.-led coalition against the Daesh group in northeastern Syria have killed about around 170 jihadists in the past 48 hours, according to a monitoring group. The jihadists were killed in the past 48 hours in the province of Hasaskan, nearly all of them very intense airstrikes by the international coalition, which is helping Kurdish forces in the area, said the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. It is the latest update on the coalition's operations, as the U.S. military said in a statement that Alliance warplanes had carried out seven strikes near the Hazaki region. They struck four uh, Danish tactical units, destroying seven vehicles, three fighting positions, two armored vehicles, and a shipping container. In northern Syria, Daesh continues to cede military capacity, fighters, and terrain, said U.S. Brigadier General Thomas Wheatley, using the Arabic acronym for IS. The coalition remains committed to targeting Daesh across Iraq and Syria, he was quoted as saying in a statement. To Iran now, where the Pentagon said on Tuesday that two Iranian warships had linked up with a cargo ship that Iran says is carrying humanitarian aid to Yemen, adding it was monitoring the ships every step of the way. According to Pentagon spokesman Colonel Steve Warren, in speaking to a news briefing, he said, quote, We're not overly con- concerned at this point. It's a single ship that we've got very good accountability of. Warren also said that the two warships linked up with the cargo ship when it passed an area where they had been conducting, according to Tehran's, counter-piracy operations. 
Another Pentagon spokesman said this happened on Monday. A senior Israeli official took a, has taken a swipe at the U.S. today over Iran's reported purchase of second-hand civilian aircraft, saying the acquisition violated international sanctions and went ahead despite a tip-off from Israel. Iranian Transport Minister Abdus Abukini was quoted on May the 11th by the Iranian Students News Agency as saying Tehran bought 15 used commercial planes in the last three months. He did not say who sold them or how they had been acquired. A long-standing ban on the export of aircrafts and spare parts to Iran was eased under an interim nuclear deal between Tehran and World Powers back in late 2013, but the sanctions regime continues to resist sales of planes. Israel learned from intelligence sources about this very significant breach of sanctions in advance of it occurring, said an Israeli official speaking on condition of amenity to, the, uh, to Reuters and ITN. We've flagged the issue to the U.S. Uh, pr administration, the official said, but unfortunately the deal still went through and there was no success in preventing it. In Washington, meantime, a U.S. State Department official speaking on condition of amenity said the Obama administration was aware of the report and said, quote, if there is a sanctionable activity, we will take action. Apparently they haven't, though. Back to the story, though. He said that while the export to Iran of U.S. made spare parts needed for safe operations of Iranian civilian airliners was now permitted within a U.S. Treasury Department license, the sale of U.S. origin aircraft was not. And we'll keep you up to date on the story as developments become available. And, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the kids around, you might want to take them away from the radio for a couple minutes because this next one is going to may disgust you and may creep the kids out a little. The remains of an American pilot who died in a plane crash in Cameroon last year are still in the cockpit, even though villagers discovered the wreckage of his anti-poaching aircraft more than a month ago according to officials in the pilot's family. The discovery of pilot Bill Fitzpatrick and his Cessna 172 in forested mountainous terrain in April had brought some relief to his family following lengthy search efforts that began after Fitzpatrick disappeared on the night of June 22nd. But Fitzpatrick's brother Ken said in an email to the Associated Press that the family is frustrated at the delay in recovering the pilot's remains and returning them to the U.S., he said, quote, Sadly, my brother is still seated in the pilot seat in the wreckage of this plane. This is horrible. African Parks, a Johannesburg-based group that employed Bill Fitzpatrick, cannot remove the remains on its own and is waiting for the Cameroon officials to assist them, said a group spokeswoman, Cynthia Wally. Yesterday, the plan is to hand over the remains to U.S. diplomats, according to Wally. Uh, Quintog Hardson, a government official in the southwest area of Cameroon, where the plane was found, said the crash site has been secured and an investigation is still underway. Rest assured that Bill's remains have been conserved and still sit on the pilot seat with the clothes he was wearing, Hardison said. Fitzpatrick's final destination was to be Cristal Kuno National Park in the Republic of Congo, which is still managed by African Parks. The job of the former Peace Corps volunteer would have been to scan the Central African Park's clearings for elf elephant carcasses from his cockpit and then alert rangers in the area who could intercept poachers escaping with ivory tusk. There was no Mayday signal on the night of that 59-year-old Fitzpatrick disappeared, suggesting he crashed into a mountain without time to react and that weather or a fuel shortage was not the cause. No signal was detected from the plane's emergency transmitter. Meanwhile, Fats Pitcher's wife Paula and their three children live in Chinchilla, Washington, here in the United States. And we'll keep you up to date because that is a disturbing story right there, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that this guy's uh, body is still in the plane and that crash was last June. I don't know what they're doing over there, but it's quite disturbing. All right, moving on to UK news now. A UKIP MEP who launched a personal attack on Nigel Farage in the aftermath of the UK elections earlier this month has stood down from his front bench role in the party. Patrick O'Flynn has stepped down as the economic spokesman and apologized to Mr. Farage for calling him, quote, a snarling, thin-skinned, and aggressive. The comments triggered a bout of bickering and infighting within the UKIP party. Another leading figure, Susanna Evans, has said she is no longer the UKIP's policy chief because her contract is ending. 
Miss Evans, who has been tipped as a possible successor to Mr. Farage, was a key figure in writing UKIP's election manifesto. She said she will remain in the unpaid role of deputy chairman. Mr. Farage, who accepted Mr. O'Flynn's apology, has insisted he has the overwhelming support of the party to stay on as leader in the aftermath of a fierce post-election row about the campaign and the party's future direction. All right, folks, now on to so, some uh, UK story that we brought to you a couple of weeks ago that's in the most of the shock and awe of most UK citizens. That, uh, this has to do with that safety deposit rate in that bank in Hampton Garden a couple of weeks back. Detectives hunting the gang behind that raid have arrested nine suspects related to the incident. The con this contest of 56 safety deposit boxes that were taken during the raid in London's jewelry district over Easter weekend in the UK. Twelve addresses in London and Kent, the Kent area were raided by about 200 police officers this morning. Nine men were arrested and a high number of high-value items were recovered, said police. Searches of the houses are still ongoing. Scotland Yard first arrested seven men aged between 48 and 76. They later arrested a 58-year-old man and a 43-year-old, bringing the total number of men arrested to nine. Police have also appealed for information on a white transit van seen in the area at the time of the raid. The van was, with the registration of DU53VNG was caught twice on CCTV cameras during the Easter heights. During a press conference at the Met office, Met Police Office, it said it felt officers had been portrayed as the Keystone Cops, while a relative of a victim said finding some of the hall could actually make things worse for those affected as it could delay insurance payouts. Thieves used heavy cutting equipment, as you may remember, to break into a vault at the Hatton Garden Safe Deposit uh, Company where they ransacked about 70 boxes. The men were arrested in Enfield, East London, and Dartford. And we'll keep you up to date on any more developments in that story. To business news now, that's internationally business news, the main measure of UK inflation turned negative in April for the first time on record, with the rate falling to below 0.1%. It is the first time the consumer price index inflation has turned negative since the year 1960 in the UK, based on comparable historical estimates, said the Office for National Statistics in the UK. The biggest contribution to the fall came from a drop in air and sea fares. The Bank of England's governor, Mark Carney, said he expected inflation to remain very low over the last few months. But Mr. Carney added that over the course of the year, as we get towards the end, inflation should start to pick up back toward their 2% target. The latest inflation figures show that transport costs were up 2.8% lower in April than the same time a year ago, while food was also 3% cheaper. Chancellor George Osborne in the UK said the inflation figure should not be mistaken for a, quote, damaging deflation. He also added that the lower cost of living driven by last year's fall in oil prices would be a welcome relief for family budgets in the UK and in an environment in which average wages were finally beginning to rise. Whatever next, you might ask? Well, this is all about corporation tax. And the tax company pays on its profits. Next. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I apparently muted my phone, but my phone decided to unmute itself. I hate when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, so my apologies on that. All right, back to this story, though, on the company Next in the UK said that they have tried moving its profits of the Next Empire in an attempt to minimize its tax bill. According to the Br British business, paid a special dividend to its Hong Kong business, boosting the rate of tax it paid in Hong Kong in which it could offset against a tax bill in Britain. Confused? Well, that's accountancy, apparently, and apparently the UK government isn't liking it and is going after next, asking the, for them to pay, net, uh, pay the government £22 billion pounds in owed taxes. If you're still confused, I'm just as confused as you are, and if you want an interpretation, I'm sure Corey Evan has one for you.
Yeah, dead air. All right, folks, move it, uh, moving on. Here's an oddball story for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And this has to do with an advertisement. And Corey Evan is sorry he didn't get this story before showtime. Apparently, Saudi Arabia has advertised vacancies for eight executioners. Yeah, you heard it right. Eight executioners uh, are, uh, started being advertised by the Saudis Tuesday after beheading nearly as many people since the start of the year as it did in the whole of 2014. The Civil Service Ministry said that no qualifications were necessary and that applicants would be exempted from the usual entrance exams. It said that as well as beheadings, the, su the successful candidates could be expected to carry out uh, uh, accusations ordered by the courts under the kingdom's strict version of Sharia law. Amputation of one or both hands is a routine penalty for theft, drug trafficking, rape, murder, apostasy, and armed robbery, which are all punishable by death. Most executions are carried out by beheading, but a few are carried out by a firing squad, stoning, or crucifixion. So, ladies and gentlemen, no qualifications necessary. All you need is, a, need is a nice machete, and you can go commit Sharia law in the Saudis, and you don't get prosecuted, and you get to do, do this and get housing expenses paid for absolutely free. Are you interested? Well, no. don't contact, well, don't contact this program because we're not giving you no information. You're going to have to find this one on your own because we're not for Sharia law on this program. All right, folks, moving on tonight to... Sweden, where a Stockholm court on Tuesday have seized the Swedish uh, web domains of file sharing website The Pirate Bay over repeated copyright violations in a bid to end the site's activities. This was the first time a Swedish prosecutor had requested that an internet address be taken off the web permanently, according to the online edition of the Swedish paper of relevance, Dangerous Nature. However, it was unclear what effect the Swedish court's decision would have. Several hours after the ruling, users typing the address Pirate Bay SE and the Pirate Bay SE were simply redirected to other Pirate Bay sites. For criminal activities, there's always been a way to get around the rules. Sweden has done what it can to show that it doesn't accept this type of activity, said Sarah Lindback, a lawyer at the Anti-Piracy Rights Alliance, who spoke to the news agency TT. Founded back in 2003, the Pirate Bay allows users to dodge copyright fees and share music, film, and other files using BitTorrent technology or peer-to-peer -peer links offered on the site. The two domains belong to a Thai woman, Shpatsif Tarafi, 25, whom the Stockholm District Court identified as the business partner of one of the Pirate Bay's co-founders, 37-year-old Vidri Ninji. Ninji has criticized the trials and attack on freedom of expression. Sweden has repeatedly tried to put an end to the Pirate Bay's activities, but to no avail. Swedish courts have already handed down prison sentences and heavy fines to its founders, Carl Lindstrom, friend Nady, as we uh, said before, God Godfried Skirtfalm Warng, and I apologize if I butchered the name, but that one was a tongue twister, and Peter Sundaldi. Servers hosting the site were seized by stock, uh, in a Stockholm suburb early last December, but the site reappeared back in late January of this year. All right, folks, I'll be back with some more news for out of D.C., including one Tennessee family who raised $187 million for cancer but spent it on themselves. All those stories and more. But first, it's now time for the national news. In Louisiana, the state Senate Judiciary Committee on Tuesday approved a bill that seeks to reform Louisiana's harsh penalties for marijuana possession, including adding a second chance provision for first time offenders. This according to NOLA.com. The bill's passage is significant because of a similar bill introduced by State Senator J.P. Morrell of New Orleans, which died on the Senate floor last year. This time around, the bill was moved out of the committee with no objections after the influential Louisiana District Attorney Association and Louisiana Sheriff's Association agreed not to oppose it. 
Morell said he rallied members from those associations and others who raised concerns about his past proposal during ex- extensive meetings to refine the bill. In the end, Morell said, quote, we worked very diligently to reach a bill that is a compromise, unquote. If it passes, it would create a structured penalty system around marijuana convictions that would limit judges' discretion for people convicted of possessing the possessing the drug. Under current law, repeat offenders are exposed to a five-year sentence and a $2,500 fine. A third offense can bring up to 20 years and $5,000 fine. The bill is estimated to save the state up to incarceration costs over five years, Morrell said. He said those penalties are as much as eight times higher than surrounding states. His bill would limit second-time offenders to a misdemeanor that caps a sentence at six months. A third offense is a felony punishable by up to four years in prison. A fourth is punishable by up to eight years. Louisiana marijuana statutes also differ from other states in not providing offenders with a chance to remove a conviction from their record if they don't re-offend. Morrell's bid would create this chance for the record expunged if they aren't convicted of a marijuana violation within two years of the first offense. A key piece of this second chance section of the legislation is that offenders are only expunge their record one time in other words they cannot wipe a second one clean so if you're a marijuana user in louisiana it's time to repent it's not like by four friends yeah i know right at any rate, from the New York Times, aided by four friends and to the cheers of some of her classmates, the student who protested Columbia University's handling of her sexual assault complaint by carrying a mattress around campus all year hoisted it for the last time today as she crossed the stage at a grand ceremony. Up until seconds before the student, Emma Sulkowicz, walked on stage, Columbia officials had asked her to leave the mattress behind. Now you see what they did. President Lee Bollinger turned away as she crossed in front of him failing to shake her hand, as he did with the other graduates. Ms. Sulkowicz's graduation and the end of her protest brought to a close a tumultuous year in which Columbia became a focus of the movement to change how universities address sexual assault. A group called No Red Tape has held protests in which it projected the words Columbia protects rapists on the facade of a school library and a number of students on Tuesday put red tape on their baby blue mortar boards to show their support. In February, the university instituted a sexual respect education requirement, which obliges students in all halls to attend or complete art projects on the theme of sexual respect. As a result of her protest, which has altered her senior art thesis, Ms. Sulkowicz herself has become the face of a national movement to raise awareness about sexual assault. She attended the State of the Fart Address this year as the guest of Senator Kirsten E. Gilbrand, Democrat of New York, who is pushing a bill that would require every college to survey its students about their experience with sexual violence, create a uniplinary protest for accusations of assault, and give law enforcement agency. So how's about that, Jay? All I, all I heard out of that story was someone walking around with a mattress. The rest of it, I'm just uh, wh- scratching my head, saying, hmm. Yeah, ditto. Uh, let, let's just, let me just put it this way. She better go over to sit and sleep and get a new mattress after dragging that one around, because I don't exactly want to. I thought you hated mattress. them. Well, I'll make an exception in this case, because anyone dragging a mattress <laughs> around outside without a cover on it, Oh, that's about that's about for bad news right there, and we don't want them to get t- fl- ticks or fleas. If you understand what. Ah, oh, you had to say fleas. Ah, oh no. Well, why like Corey gets those fleas taken care of, ladies and gentlemen? That's a good excuse to to send it to a break. When we come back on tonight's program tonight, one top Democrat is sounding alarm bells over the Obama administration's rhetoric on the Denise tonight. House of Representatives have a bill out that would cap expenses for previous ex-presidents. And in tonight's Global Socialism, we definitely go global tonight when a judge rules against a Christian couple who owns a bakery supporting a gay couple. I'm Jason Miller, and now and you're listening to tonight's Evan Miller Report. And there's Corey Evan. He has the business news. Ah, uh, yes, and in business, Takata has added, wait for it, 34 million, or almost 34 million, more vehicles to their recall list, declaring the airbags in those cars defective. So if you're driving around in the car with an airbag, 
listen up. In addition to that Philadelphia track derailment item to the docket in lawsuits across America, we also have the fight of the century being called the fluke of the century. And in addition to Letterman's countdown to his last show ever, fans are swearing off the Game of Thrones. And why, when we come back, you're listening to SHR Media's The Evan Miller Report. I'm Corey Evan. Listening to the SHR Media Network. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. This is Tammy Jackson inviting you to join me on the Tammy Jackson Show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on the 405radio.com. Put down that remote and tune into the show that covers politics, Guns in the Second Amendment, Religious Liberty, Sanctity of Life, the Military, and more. I host newsworthy guests and work hard to be a conservative radio show that's not like all the others. So stay Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific for me, Tammy Jackson, on the 405media.com. Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion, or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature, and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hi, this is Rooster from Outcry Radio. Catch me here on Blog Talk Radio every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or follow my blog. Now back to the Sackheads. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. At St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, our discoveries have helped drive the childhood cancer survival rate from 20% to 80%. And we share our research all across America. I'm 80% sure I'll spoil my kids. I'm 80% sure I'll break boys' hearts. I'm 80% sure we're chick magnets. 80%? I'll take those off. <laughs> give thanks for the healthy kids in your life and give to those who are not. Go to stjude.org or shop wherever you see the St. Jude logo. Rescuers in Colombia are continuing to search for victims of a landslide which killed more than 60 people and injured dozens. I'm Corey Evan. You're listening to the Evan Miller Report. Thanks for joining us once again. Rescue efforts using search dogs resumed in the Colombian town of Salgar at dawn, having suspended overnight. An unknown number of people are missing following the landslide which occurred in the early hours of Monday morning, destroying the homes of more than 500 people. The National Disaster Unit said in a statement that 64 were killed and at least 40 others had been treated for injuries. Heavy rains caused a landslide in the La Liberiana Ravine, blocking it off and causing an overflow which destroyed the neighborhood below. It is the country's worst landslide since 2005. Authorities in Salgar nestled inside steep Andean slopes in a coffee-growing region 
Antioquia Department, northwest of the capital Bogota, have partially restored electricity and water services. The United Nudists have said that some 18,000 people had been without drinking water. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos visited the affected area on yes- yesterday and declared a public emergency, freeing up relief funds for victims. And we will keep an eye on this story and bring you updates as they become available. Very unfortunate situation there, Jay. Yeah, certainly is. Our thoughts and prayers are with those people over in Columbia tonight. Thank you very much, Corey. Corey Evan, back with the business news in just a moment. A Tennessee man and his family used much of the $187 million it collected for cancer patients to buy themselves cars, gym memberships, and to take a luxury cruise vacations and pay for their college tuition and employ family members with six-figure salaries. This, according to federal federal officials, who are alleged Tuesday in one of the largest charity fraud cases ever involving all 50 states. The joint action by the Federal Trade Commission and the state says that James T. Reynolds Sr., his ex-wife and son, raised money through their various charities. The Cancer Fund of America in Knoxville, Tennessee, and its affiliated Cancer Support Services, the Breast Cancer Society in Mesa, Arizona, and the Children's Cancer Fund of America in Powell, Tennessee. The charities hired telemarketers to collect up to tw- uh, collect $20 donations from people across the country, telling consumers that they a- provided financial aid and other support to cancer patients, including pain medication transportation to chemotherapy visits, and hospice care. But little money made it to cancer patients as the groups operated as personal theodums, characterized by rampant neotism, flagrant conflicts of interest, and excessive insider compensation with none of the controls used by bona fide charities, said the FTC Tuesday. Anyone who donated money to these groups shouldn't expect a refund anytime soon, though. Uh, while litigation against Reynolds Sr. and the Cancer Fund of America is ongoing. The settlement agreements with the Reynolds' son, ex-wife, and longtime associate of the family, Kyle Effler, notes that much of the money has already been spent, and the agreement bans the three from fundraising and shuttered their organizations. The money is mostly gone, said Jessica Rich, director of the FTC Bureau of Consumer Protection. Rich has declined to say whether a separate criminal investigation might be underway, noting only that the regulatory agency doesn't have that authority. None of the groups returned phone calls and emails asking for comment. Attempts to reach family members at home by telephone were also unsuccessful to the Associated Press. Wow. Disturbing story. Waste of $187 million. I certainly hope someone goes and hits the slammer for that one. Ditto. Mm. Simple word, ditto today. I think that's a new word we need to add to the dictionary. Ditto. I think it's already in there, but yeah, added to our list of regularly used words. Ditto. And speak of ditto, it's ditto politics time for DC News today. And we start off in the DC politics with the top Democrat sounding alarm bells over President Obama's recent rhetoric on Islamic State. A senior House of Representatives Democrat said today that the White House's description of supposed progress in the war against Islamic State or Daesh should ring alarm bells and call the fall of the city of Ramadi to the extremist a, quote, very serious and significant setback. And uh, uh, he continued, quote, I don't think we're losing the war, but I don't think we're making tremendous progress either, said Representative Adam Schiff, the top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, told reporters at a breakfast organized by the Christian Science Monitor. Ooh, that's interesting. The California Democrat has asked the White House Deputy Press Secretary Eric Schultz recitation last week of the number of U.S. and partner strikes to counter a reporter's question about whether the Islamic State is winning. He shipped cautioned, quote, I would use, wouldn't use the metrics of the numbers of sorties or bombs dropped or anything. So, and to the degree you hear administration officials use those metrics, alarm bells should be going off. 
The lawmaker also warned against using measures like the amount of territory controlled by Islamic State, also known as ISIL or ISIS. Uh, we just call it the niche, so let's get right to it, because in some cases, the group has been replaced by other extremist militias hostile to the United States. And in that part, I agree with the Democrat on this one. Even before the fall of Ramadi, the largest city in the pivotal Iraqi province of Anbar, the White House has struggled to paint a hopeful picture of the war on ISIL. On Friday, Roll Call reporter Stephen Dennis pointedly asked his press secretary, uh, one of the press secretaries in the White House, Schultz, are we losing this war? The spokesman then responded that 60 countries were part of the coalition to beat back the likes of ISIL and cited as evidence of progress in the campaign the fact that the U.S. and partner nations had carried out 3,900 airstrikes, including 2,400 in Iraq and about 1,500 in Syria. You know what? I actually agree. It's a rare opportunity here that I am agreeing with the likes of, of this Democrat here, Adam Schiff, tonight, Corey, because you know what? You can say as many numbers as you want and how many airstrikes you've done, how much you've done with the coalition, but you don't answer the key question. Are we defeating the likes of ISIL? And if we're looking at it currently today, and I'm no military expert, but if you're here... It looks like a big fat no to me. Right. If you're looking at what's going on in the region right now, you see the pictures, you hear the audio that comes into our newsroom every day of, the, of this, it is no. We are not defeating ISIL, we're not defeating ISIS, and we're not be defeating Daesh. And I speak all of those terms just so our friends on the left get in their thick skull that we're losing this war. And you know why we lost this war in the first place, ladies and gentlemen? It's because President Obama decided to pull our troops out too early and did not finish the mission over there. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we may not agree that we should have went to war in Iraq in the first place, but... We are over there. We are already over there. We have our troops over there. We need to finish the job, and then we need to get, uh, need then to pull our troops out. And what President Obama did, he was more looking for uh, to cater to his political friends on the left than to worry about our boys who are going over there to fight day in and day out. And unfortunately, it is my brutal opinion that our troops uh, troops lost their lives in vain because of President Obama's decisions. And this just this newsman's opinion. Agreed. All right, folks. All right, folks. One more story on the D.C. circuit before I send it over to Corey Evan with tonight's business news. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and other former presidents who earn lucrative speaking fees and draw other income would no longer be able to count on taxpayer dollars to pay for their post-White House office space and staff under a new bill in the House of Representatives. On a voice vote, the House Oversight Panel backed a measure Tuesday to limit taxpayer dollars for expenses, including travel incurred by ex-presidents who earn more than $400,000 a year. U.S. taxpayers paid a total of $3.5 million last year alone in pensions and benefits to the four living former presidents, including $1.3 million for Bush, $950,000 for Clinton, and according to a report by the Congressional Research Service. Most of that money was, spr was for sprawling office space in Dallas and New York, respectively. Both Clinton and Bush, like other ex-presidents before them, have earned millions of dollars in speaking fees since leaving office. The Oversight Committee acted just days after Hillary Rodham Clinton reported that she and her husband earned more than $30 million combined in speaking fees and book royalties since January 2014. The earnings put the couple in the top what, tenth of 1% of all Americans. Wait a second. So if they're the top 1% of Americans, should they, and they're going after the top, uh, after the one percenters here in the United States, Corey, then they're actually going after themselves. Okay, well, if you're going to go go there and be taking people's ta taxes and taxing the rich, well, we want some of that money too. So, Corey, let's go. I want $10 million of that $30 million sent over to me. You can have $10 million, and guess what? The $10 other million can go over to our D.C. guy, Ken McClinton, over in Washington, D.C. How does that sound? Sounds like a plan. I could finally get some of my concepts on, at least to a pilot tape. Absolutely right. See, it, see, you're got getting the, uh, getting money already from the taxpayers. So you want to redistribute the wealth of the already the one percent. You're part of the one percent. We expect our ten percent 
of that $30 million. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not a joke. That's a real thing. That should be done. So the Clintons, ooh, we got you now. We're cut. Yes, we're you right and now. That, in fact, that's my fee right there for all these stupid Bill Clinton impersonations. <laughs> And that note, ladies and gentlemen, that is the DC News. And now it's time for the closing bell. And speaking of the closing bell, the Dow was up barely 13 points at 18,312, while the others, the NASDAQ, down by 8 at 5070, and the SP 500 down one, one and a third of a point at 2127. Went the other way, yep. Yeah. So, Wall Street, would you like to throw that one back? As expected, Walmart's first quarter earnings were below analyst projections. A kitchen sink's worth of reason for the best. The strong dollar, employee wage increases, consumer wallet tightening, including myself, lower gas pr- Well, I disagree on the lower gas prices because I live in California. And weakness in its e-commerce business. The truth is a lot simpler. Walmart has a sales problem. The company brought in essentially flat sales numbers at stores open at least a year, reporting an anemic 1% increase. Anemic, yeah, there we are. It's not a new story. Back in November, the company announced its first quarter of positive comparable sales, a still weak half percent in the U.S., after seven straight quarters of declines. It should be noted that back then the exchange rate was also cited as an earnings dampener, even though the company's earnings were actually above analyst estimates. Over to the fine folks in Japan, Takata, leading global supplier of automotive systems, announced today that an estimated 33.8 million cars will be recalled due to de- defective airbags manufactured by one of their subsidiaries. Yeah, a lot of doo-doo going on here. This is the largest recall of a consumer product in U.S. history, followed by the 1982 Tylenol recall of 31 million bottles of the pain reliever after a poisoning scare. Takata's airbags have been at the center of a controversy with the U.S. Department of Transport and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration after the company's airbags were linked to at least five deaths and more than 100 injuries, according to DOT Secretary Anthony Fox. Takata has dodged liability of these claims until now. The admission is that the airbags were defective and it's a big win for NHTSA which has been pushing the company to take responsibility since November and let's hope that they finally get this thing deflated there we are just was I a loss for words there yeah and the LA City Council tentatively agreed today to raise the city's minimum wage to $15 an hour, joining a trend sweeping cities across the country as elected leaders seek to address stagnating pay for workers on the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. The ordinance would boost the 9 buck an hour base wage to 15 by 2020 for as many as 800,000 workers, city officials say, and make LA the largest U.S. city to adopt a major minimum wage increase. Chicago, San Fran, and Seattle have already adopted similar laws, and Jay, I have a feeling that this will affect one big industry over there, the restaurant industry, because mm. right now, Angeleno's dying out more than any other city in the U.S., at least that's one report I read somewhere. So... Trying to earn that $15 an hour, it's going to be hard to find a place to work if they're being forced to pay this much, isn't it? Yeah, they'll go down from three waitresses down to one waitress, and that one waitress is going to say, why do I work here for $15 when I'm doing all the work? She'll go find another job elsewhere. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm guessing that means they're trying to push them to buy robots to serve all the dinners, and I would be kind of creeped out if they did Oh, you're thinking Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox again. See, ladies and gentlemen, that's Actually, I was thinking more along weekend. the lines of the Jetsons. Well, either way, that's bo- that's bo- both the futuristic shows. See, Corey, I've been watching the morning cartoons on the weekends uh, right before the SHR weekend or 3 Eastern. Aren't I just a kid see, at heart? Yeah, see, the pro- see, ladies and gentlemen, Corey Evan just got himself a free promo. And on that note, that wraps up the business news. And we're going to be brief in tonight's Global Socialism segment. I'll, we'll air that special little theme at the end as Corey has ran up a wonderful little uh, closing statement on that. So, But we start off tonight's Global Socialism in Ireland tonight, where a judge has ruled that a Christian-run bakery discriminated against a gay customer by refusing... I apologize about the noise in the background, ladies and gentlemen. Back to the story. 
the ju uh, judge ruled that the Christian bakery discriminated against a gay customer by refusing to make a cake with a pro-gay marriage slogan. Asher's Baking Company, based in Country Atrium in Ireland, was taken to court by gay rights activist Gareth Lee. A Belfast judge said as businesses, the Ashers were not exempt from discrimination law. The firm's general manager said they were extremely disappointed by the ruling and are considering an appeal. Damages of 500 pounds were agreed in advance by legal teams on both sides of the dispute. A lawyer for Mr. Lee said the money would be donated to charity. The judge said the Ashers is conducting a business for profit and it is not a religious group. The firm was found to have discriminated against Mr. Lee on the grounds of his sexual orientation as well as his political beliefs. A school teacher who gained permission to have an additional child in her hometown in one Chinese province has been ordered to have an abortion because the province where she is teaching has different rules. This according to a family planning officer today. The case illustrates how different areas have different family planning regulations and how unyielding China's birth limits continue to be despite a recent loosening in the 35-year-old policy to allow more couples to have two children. Both pregnant Onyan Yi and her husband Magna Shape had a daughter with their previous spouses so their newly married couple is not allowed to have their own child according to Jinsko Province's regulations. The Education Bureau and Health and Family Planning Commission in Goats of Libville County said in a notice on Monday. Quinn must have an abortion by the end of the month, otherwise she will be fired from her job, said the notice circulated online and carried by a local newspaper which reported that Quinn was five months pregnant. An officer from the county's Health and Family Planning Commission confirmed the case. Quinn and Megna applied for permission to have the child from the authorities in Hongshan City in eastern Anya province where her residency is registered said the officer who only gave his surname, also Quinn, surprisingly. The authority is investigating whether Quinn transferred her residency to Anla earlier this year in order to gain permission to give birth, said the officer. Anyan province allows couples to have a child if they don't have more than two children from previous marriages, where Gospasla only lets a couple have a child if there's just one previous child. Environmentalists reacted angrily today. Oh boy, Corey, it time to get out the bug spray because we got a bunch of environmental hornets. Oh boy. Yeah, they reacted angrily to a controversial shipment of fin whale meat to Japan by an Icelandic whaling company saying it filed at international mm. conservation agreements. The Icelandic whaling company, Herval or HF plans to ship 1,700 tons of whale meat via Luandia in Anjolda, repeating a similar controversial delivery of 2,000 tons last year, which sparked more protests along its route. There, uh, this is an animal welfare issue, said, uh, uh, said a spokesman at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. There is no humane way to kill animals of that size. There is no need for this meat and certainly no need for Iceland's economy or fisheries industry to have this. This shipment has faced a strong international opposition. Commercial whaling is a very isolated business and we want to see the end of it, as does most of the world. Well, that's according to them, Corey Evan. Mm-mm. Disturbing mm -mm, story okay. there. Well, they ain't going to stop me from eating my tuna, that's for sure. That's another Neither. story for another day. A law signed this week here in the U.S. in the state of Texas now prohibits cities and towns from banning fracking and other activities that harvest oil and natural gas. The law was drafted after voters in Dayton, a city outside the Dallas area, banned hydraulic fracturing locally in 2014. Fracking opponents warn that potential carcinogens used in the extrication process may contaminate groundwater. Similar bills are being considered in other U.S. states including Colorado, Ohio, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Republican te uh, governor in Texas, Greg Abbott, called the anti-fracking measures heavy-handed regulations. And now it's over to Corey Evans with the rest of tonight's Global Socialism. And yes, Corey Evans, I did not forget you. 
I'm glad you didn't, and I'll be brief on these ones. According to the AP, the Illinois House has approved a ban on therapy that supporters say can change the sexual orientation of young gays. There was no debate on the measure before it was okay, 68 to 43. The bill now goes to their Senate for approval. Representative Kelly Cassidy supports the bill, which gay and lesbian advocates support. And you can tell they support it because there was no real debate on that one. And the Cannes Film Festival became the latest backdrop for the fight against gender bias in the movie industry after some women were turned away from the red carpet for not wearing high heels. What? At least according to... Yeah, I know. Actress Emily Blunt was responding to a report from the industry publication Screen Daily to media outlets that a handful of women in their 50s were turned away from a screening Sunday night because they weren't wearing heels. Asif Kapadia, director of the critically acclaimed Amy that premiered at the festival, said his wife was stopped for the same reason at his screening the day before and eventually let in. Come on, people. Let these ladies wear flats to these premieres. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a good pair of flats. I'm one who doesn't particularly like high heels. Like, I don't mind if my future missus wears a high heel every now and again, just like one or two inches tops, but I prefer that she wear flats more regularly, and she seems to be comfortable with that. So, ladies, if you're comfortable in flats, go ahead. And if that theme is ready... So, when will our elected leaders start respecting religious leaders for real? How much longer must the ladies put their backsides on the line just to please men? And who will buy me and my wife a Will It Blend blender so I can blend iPhone? We can blend iPhone. Stay tuned for developments in our continuing battle against global socialism. Global socialism. There we are. Almost forgot the echo. Must be the frosting on that gay cake that those people want in Ireland. Corey mm-hmm. Evans. Global Socialism tonight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for an abbreviated version of tonight's Lawsuits Across America. And now it's time for Lawsuits Across America. The cases are real. All rise for the Honorable Corey Evan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit, 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 people. I'll be brief with this. A conductor critically injured in last week's deadly train derailment in Philly has sued Amtrak, accusing the publicly funded pasture rail company of negligence, his lawyer said on Tuesday, adding to a string of lawsuits since the crash. Emilio Fonseca was taking a restroom break in the first car during his work shift when the passenger train went off the rails, according to attorney Bruce Nagel, saying that the train suddenly surged forward and then crashed. Boxing fans across the country and their lawyers are calling the hyped-up fight between Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather Jr. fraud and want their money back and then some. At least 32 U.S. lawsuits seeking class action status allege Pacquiao should have disclosed a shoulder injury to fans before the fight, which Mayweather won in a unanimous decision after 12 rounds that most fans thought All right, folks, I apologize. We seem to have lost Corey Evan there. See, it uh, happened last night, too. Apparently, people didn't want to hear tonight's lawsuits across America, or at least that Pacquiao story. Let's see if we have him back. Is it working now? I think we have you back, Mr. Evan. Back to what you were doing. Yeah, like I was saying, judges are going to consider combining all these different lawsuits into one before they go forward. And a lawyer representing three women who filed a sexual discrimination and retaliation lawsuit against West Des Moines Police Chief Sean Ledoux provided more details on their case Monday afternoon, and I will go ahead and post that one up on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Evan Miller Report, due to time. Case dismissed, people! Corey Evan with tonight's Lawsuits Across America. And we just have just enough time for one entertainment story and one entertainment story only. And ladies and gentlemen, here's your entertainment guru. It's Corey. Yes, we should put on a late night show now that Letterman's going off the air. Only two more episodes of Late Show with David Letterman. Tonight, Dave welcomes Bill Murray, who has been a traditional first guest for Letterman shows and Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, there we are. Tomorrow night is Dave's last late show. All right, carrying on, as his late show retirement draws near, Letterman is being saluted by other late-night hosts, as well as frequent guests. In his more than 30 years in late-night, Letterman showed the current generation of hosts just how much you can do with this decades-old format. Everything from the stupid human tricks 
top 10 list, which I have parodied in my college radio years as the bottom 10 list. Remember that, Jay? Oh, yeah. Good times. Good times. And it's also interesting to note that uh, Letterman also did a pilot for a game show called The Riddlers, which him being the comedian he is kind of made sense for him. And Jay, I'll send that over to you as well for you to at least view up and hopefully you'll enjoy at least the first I'd say 30 seconds of it ought to get you. Mm. On that note, that's your entertainment report. Corey Evan with the entertainment report tonight. Funny he does Letterman because so did our friends over at BBC World News America too tonight. Don't know what consolidation that has to do. And not that I like to advertise for our friends at the competition. I just happen to like that program. It hasn't won Emmys for a reason and we haven't won talk show host of the year by the Eagle Forum of California. Not that we're boasting Corey Evan on the whole th- on the whole thing, but ladies and gentlemen, on that note, that is the Evan Miller report for this Tuesday, May the 19th, 2015. For Corey Evan and all of us here at SHR Media, we wish you a good night. Coming up next is the National Weather Forecast with the BBC Med Offices uh Bill Rich tonight as the weather forecast for across the nation. Good night, everybody. Hello there. We've had no shortage of thunderstorms and even tornadoes across the United States over the last couple of weeks. And there is another batch of severe weather on the way. You can see this very angry stripe of cloud just spreading out across the map. We've already seen some torrential thundery downpours and very strong gusty squally winds and that severe weather during Wednesday trundles its way ever further towards the east affecting say parts of uh, western Georgia and uh, some parts of the Midwest by the end of the day. Now ahead of it across the eastern seaboard things largely dry 18 Celsius 64 Fahrenheit the top temperature there in New York. Further west well it stays unsettled further batches of rain or showers for western areas of Canada, certainly for the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., and even spilling down into some northern parts of California, where, of course, we really need some rain further south across California. We hold on to dry weather. As I mentioned, a pretty decent day across the northeast. New York to Washington, fine, with some pleasant sunshine and uh, some fairly pleasant temperatures as well. Further south for northern areas of Florida, we're going to see some heavy thundery downpours and a fairly hot day in Orlando, 90 Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Further ahead, then Thursday and Friday, things warm up in New York, should stay dry. It's a patchy cloud at times in Atlanta, some further heavy showers there in Miami. Elsewhere in Vancouver, it looks set fair with some good spells of sunshine. 23 Celsius is 73 Fahrenheit for Thursday's top. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network.